Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this week's uh, Brown Bag Launch Seminars. Um, and this week, we have uh, two presentations. And the first presenter is Kyan Shirazi. And he is uh, currently uh, a fourth year uh, AE student working at the Space Systems Design Laboratory under Dr. Lacey. He has been working on the GT1 mission as part of the Structured Subsystem team. The team focused on designing, analyzing, testing, and integrating various structural and mechanical flight hardware and GSE components. And today, he will be presenting on a unique UHF antenna deployment mechanism developed for the GT1 CubeSat. And the title of his presentation is Development Mechanism Techniques for GT1 CubeSat Mission. Uh, okay, uh, Ken, all yours. All right, thank you, Dr. Sun. All right, guys, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope everybody's doing well. Um, my name is Kian Shirazi, and I'll be presenting on the topic of deployment mechanism techniques for GT1 mission. So first, I want to provide an outline for my presentation. Um, first, I want to provide some background information on CubeSats, why they've become more popular within the last decade or so, as well as talk about what the GT1 mission is. And then a little bit talk about the motivation for uh, deployment mechanisms, why they're necessary and needed. Um, and then given the time constraint of this presentation, uh, GT1 actually has two types of deployment mechanisms for an antenna as well as solar panels. But like I mentioned, the time constraint allows for and therefore I'm going to UHF antenna deployment mechanism. And we're going to talk about things from driving requirements all the way to the different ways we thought about manufacturing it, testing, as well as we encountered. And then um, move on to the conclusion and provide some recommendations for uh, future missions that are going to also use a deployment mechanism for their antenna. The first, uh, as I mentioned for background, so CubeSats uh, in the past uh, decade or so, there's been a very, they've been very interesting. A lot of communities have started using them. And the reason for that is because they offer opportunities to conduct scientific investigation and technology demonstrations in such a way that is quite timely and relatively easy to accomplish. And the way I see it is that you see all these big spacecrafts, you know, they have a lot of components. CubeSats are very essential um, sort of subsystems that the bigger ones uh, include as well. So uh, to, to give you a little bit of background on what the GT1 mission is, uh, GT1 is a student-led uh, one-year CubeSat mission that was sponsored as an internal research and development activity. Um, and one of the, the main objective really is to develop and demonstrate a flight proven one year CubeSat that can be used for future missions um, that are, you know, GT2, GT3, GT4. And we also want this to be a rapid design to operations mission life cycle of about two years uh, per flight. And I think a very important objective uh, that comes out of this as well is that we want to train um, the student workforce, especially, you know, undergraduates to get exposed and learn more about um, how to build uh, spacecraft flight hardware, how to test them, how to manufacture, as well learn how to operate them. Um, I was involved um, specifically in the structure subsystem team um, in the GT1 mission, and we focused on um, designing, analyzing, testing, and integrating various structural and mechanical components. And one of the key flight hardware components that we needed to uh, design and make was the deployable mechanism for the UHF antenna. So moving on to uh, our motivation for why we needed deployment mechanisms is that there are certain components of spacecraft such as you know the antenna or solar panels that are critical to a spacecraft's mission um, but they can often be much larger than the spacecraft size permits and therefore um, a stowed configuration of the spacecraft is required in order for it to fit inside the launch vehicle interface. For example, you can um, see here, um, oops, sorry. So you can see here we have a 3U CubeSat and it has all its antennas deployed as well as its solar panels deployed. And this is a very common um, launch vehicle interface. So you can see you can't really fit this in here. And the whole point of these CubeSats is that they're very small and they can you know, fit into a very small uh, launch vehicle interface and that allows them to be very cost effective. So you don't have to pay that much for the very expensive cost of the launch vehicle rides. So 
in order for this to be able to fit into this, you really wanted to make sure that all everything is just into that sort of cube-like, rectangular-like um, shape. Um, and what the primary challenges that really come with these um, sort of deployable mechanisms is that you want to design to achieve a tight packaging efficiency without really compromising the strength needed to survive launch or the re reliability to successfully um, deploy once you're in orbit. And um, these, these deployment mechanisms are usually deployed only once um, after you detach from the launch vehicle interface, uh, usually around like 30 minutes once you're in your own orbit. Um, so now I want to provide sort of a brief overview of the sort of the development process and the thinking process that you would go through about um, designing and making. So you first want to, you know, identify and uh, define your requirements. What are the things that are really driving your design? And then you want to look at preliminary designs, do a lot of trade studies, uh, speak with the your subsystem team, and sort of evaluate different options that you have, and then sort of narrow down on one option, and then create a very sort of general uh, preliminary design of that and analyze it. And then from there, you move on to, you know, doing different changes onto the design and making it more detailed and more detailed as well as doing more analysis and testing while you do that. And finally, you will converge into the final solution uh, for your design. And then that's when you move on to uh, manufacturing it um, as well as assembling it and fully integrating it into the spacecraft as well as doing testing on the assembly, as well as testing inside the spacecraft to make sure that everything is working correctly. So first, uh, I want to sort of, there were no formal requirements for how the, sort of the deployment mechanism should have uh, been built or designed, but I thought it was important that we needed to define some uh, sort of requirements. So certain things were such as, you know, we have a UHF monopole um, antenna of length 163 millimeters and width of six millimeters. So this is really important because the whole point of this is to encapsulate this and make sure this is deployed. We want to make sure that we minimize the volume and the mass of the entire um, mechanism, as well as we want to have a retention um, system that is reliable so that it keeps the antenna stowed in a secure state during launch, as well as um, when it's, um, and deployment from launch vehicle. And then uh, we wanna also make sure that our retention system is designed in a fail safe manner. And then uh, our deployment mechanism, we wanna make sure that that actuation is really ensuring the proper deployment of the antenna and there are no interferences with that. And then as well as we wanna make sure that this is structurally sound. And so it, the correct interface with the primary structure really allows that so that we could survive launch as well as the antenna needs to be shielded from um, contacting electrically conducted structural components so that we don't damage um, other circuits on the spacecraft. And finally, we want to make sure we eliminate possibly of trapped air pockets as we move from pretty much one atmosphere to essentially nothing. We don't want any air pockets trying to put any forces or torques on the spacecraft or even cause any um, sort of bursts and whatnot. And so there are three key elements within the mechanism. You have the antenna, then you want to serve a housing mechanism and a retention mechanism that keeps it secured and a burning mechanism. To give you an overview of deployment mechanism, there are two things that you need to develop, as I mentioned. One is a retention mechanism that keeps it stowed, and then a burn mechanism that allows the uh, mechanism to actually deploy the antenna. Um, and I first want to give you guys a brief a general overview of the functionality and then dive into the design characteristics so you guys sort of already have an idea of how it works. So as you can see here, there's a stowed configuration and there's a deployed. So when you have it deployed, you basically are able to, you coil this antenna into this housing mechanism, and then you close this hinge door, and then you use a burn wire uh, to go through that hole, and you make some knots, and then you go through the resistors, and you go through this vented hole, and then you anchor it here, and that acts as your uh, tensioning mechanism to keep sure, to make sure that everything is stowed. And then you have the resistors as your burn mechanism, so you can pass current through them and they get hot and they burn through the burn wire, and allowing for deployment. As well as you see some screws here and here and the standoff that allow for the attachment of this to the primary structure, especially the top plate, um, to make sure that it's structurally sound and survives launch. So moving on to the retention um, mechanism design. Um, so the mechanism consists of three parts, the top plate here, and then you have this bottom plate as well as this door. Um, so first, you want to make sure that you minimize the volume, and that's really based off the, uh, the antenna. 
we tried to coil the antenna beforehand based off the length of it to make sure we um, to see how much we can coil it um, without making sure when it sort of springs back out it's not really deformed and then so that gives us sort of the area that we can work with and then there are two aspects of the retention mechanism that we want to focus on so one we want to make sure that the deployment actuation is smooth as possible and reliable as possible so we have this hinge door that we use a torsion spring uh, specifically a 90 degree torsion spring so that when it's in the open state it is not you know constrained or anything but when you close it it's like a spring and wants to sort of open up as fast as possible and sort of spring out and then we, as well we have the coiled antenna that is a spring steel alloy as well when it's coiled up wants to spring out so those are really you know providing that deployment force and other things that we uh, sort of focus on and making sure we have a smooth surface as well as these rounded edges right here um, to make sure that they sort of facilitate that deployment and then the retention force so what are we how are we trying to make sure that this is stowed before it gets deployed so we use this burn wire called stren which is a fluorocarbon fishing line and you can sort of here see it in the real image that we use and how this works is we basically tie uh, clovage and square knots here as well as put some staking compounds and this will go through and go through the resistors and then go through this vented bowl bolts up here and then it's anchored again tied down and knotted here and it's anchored here so once this is um, sort of anchored at this point at this point you can actually um, unscrew this bolt and as you un uh, unscrew this bolt you're sort of taking it up and you're putting a tension on that um, on that burn wire causing it uh, more retention force to make sure that this door is fully shut um, and there's certain aspects of that so we made sure you know like the hinge here we made sure there were rounded edges so that they don't really cut into the um, burn wire um, we put staking to make sure that the knots even though they were recommended by NASA that um, there's like you know double assurance that they would not come on tie as well as make sure that the round edges of here are sort of filed down a little bit to make sure there's no sharp edges to cut into the burn wire and finally there are a few interfaces that we had to make sure there's a coax and the two bolts here that make sure that um, the antenna is attached to the housing mechanism as well as it's connected to the coax that provides essentially how the antenna would work as well as we have um, bolt holes on the top plate here here and here that would attach to the main primary structure and make sure that uh, it's structurally sound and you know won't move and then so the second aspect is the burn mechanism so as I showed earlier that it would go through the resistors and now this is sort of a specific look on that very detailed look so we made a knot here and we staked it here and you go through here you go above the first resistor the second resistor and then you go up the vented hole and then it's anchored here again so there are a few design characters that you have to um, design around which is one is like redundancy we don't want to have just one resistor like in the case that one resistance fails we at least have another opportunity to fire another one that can burn the burn wire second we want to maximize the area of the contact that these burn wires have on the resistors to make sure that proper burning actually happens however this is a little bit limited based off the space debris mitigation and that also is included with the burning sequence for example if you put uh, you burn both of these resistors at the same time then you're going to have this middle sort of uh, burn wire part that's just going to be floating in space and that's space debris and uh, we can't really do that or if, for example if you loop around both of them to maximize your um, maximize your the amount of area that you have if it gets uniformly hot and it burns both on the top and the bottom at the same time now you have a little bit of burn wire here that is going to be uh, a space debris additionally we know that there was some force from the burn wire on these resistors like an upward force or a swaying force so we made sure to stake the legs down after they had been soldered to uh, make sure that nothing would happen to them finally the specifically the resistor selection uh, the value for that um, we make sure that it was a trade-off between the power drain and temperature reach and burning time so you want to make sure you minimize the power that you're using uh, but have the temperature that you finally arrive at that can burn the thing as well as the burning time matters you don't it doesn't necessarily have to happen immediately but that burning time changes as you change the amount of power drained um, and the temperature reach but finally we reached to the conclusion that we wanted to use the 15 ohm resistors so now we move on to the manufacturing material selection there were some drivers of how we wanted to manufacture this uh, certain things were you know we want to use a non-conductive material which usually pushes you towards a plastic uh, 
Um, then we had outgassing requirements that we had to meet. Um, then we wanted to be a rapid, rapid prototyping. As I mentioned, this mission is supposed to happen very quickly, so we wanted to be able to build this very uh, quickly and get it uh, so we could assemble it and test it. Then we wanted to make sure the material that we used well, had flight heritage, so we know that the radiation environment, the temperature environment that it is um, going to be at, this has already been proven. And then additionally, we wanted to make sure it was lightweight, it was strong and heat resistant material. And finally, um, as a rule of thumb, you, you don't usually want to put threads into a plastic, so you want to make sure that, you, that it's compatible with some sort of threaded insert that you can insert in there. So we ended up going with additive manufacturing. Um, this is because of the fast, um, fast manufacturing technique that it provides, sort of the accuracy, uh, as well as the ability to uh, sort of cut costs. It's not super expensive. For example, when you want to do CNC, you have to put some money for the programming and it takes longer. And some of these parts, some of them were so detailed that would just really raise the cost of it. And we use Ultim 9085, which is a high performance thermoplastic that has flat heritage. It's easy to work with and it features a high strength to weight ratio, excellent heat resistance and high impact strength. So um, that matched all of our qualifications. So it was a, the way to go. And then, so we have our fasteners. These are, um, we use mil spec because of the requirements and they're stainless steel fasteners, which are very common and strong and I've used on previous spacecrafts. And then we have the threaded inserts. We use where heat inserts. Um, basically, you put some heat using like a sawing iron or whatnot on these heat inserts. And then as they get hot, they can, you can push it through those clearance holes and they would sort of melt around those holes and then sort of stick in there as they cool down. It sort of fits in there um, perfectly. And then finally, once we got the parts, they weren't as smooth as we wanted to be, so we made sure that we sanded them down uh, so that they create sort of there's no friction between the antenna deploying or the hinge door not trying to open and whatnot. So finally, now we get to the testing. We did various types of testing, um, functional testing. So throughout that preliminary design, that detailed design, uh, I created a lot of these models. I would make changes and then create. Um, various parts using the 3D printer with PLA, just to make sure that everything was functioning properly and everything was fitting correctly. We did various types of thermal testing uh, based off the thermal profile of our orbit to make sure that the based off the thermal expansion coefficients that it won't expand too much to cause resistance between the parts and it won't deploy because of that. Um, and then finally, we also did some integration testing, some fit check with the entire primary structure to make sure there were no interferences with other components. Um, as well as make sure that when the deployment happens within the entire spacecraft that uh, it works properly. And here's a nice video that sort of shows the result of the um, project, I think. All right. Here's the antenna mechanism. And we can see that we gave it some voltage and it deployed perfectly. So finally, now, uh, recent problems. So recently, um, due to COVID-19, GT1 had to, was supposed to be delivered in the fall or in the spring, but now got pushed back to this fall. Um, upon returning school, um, we looked back at the spacecraft to make sure everything was all right and nothing had been sort of changed. And we found that the, there were a series of cracks and fractures discovered in various locations on the antenna mount, as you can see sort of here around the bolt hole area specifically. And we tried to do some research to figure out why this was happening. And we found out that um, Ultim 9085, when additively manufactured, um, it can actually, it, when it's in a sort of a, it's stored in a more humid condition, uh, it decreases in tensile strength and failure strength by a lot. And this basically means it becomes weaker and more brittle. And we also think that the low quality of the FDM additive manufacturing might have also contributed to creating st uh, stress concentrations and defects. So now we had to, you know, we're on a short uh, sort of schedule, so we really have to think of another idea. And so what we did is we sort of looked at different materials. We looked at Perform and Bluestone, which are other types of um, plastics that have been used before on um, spacecraft, so they have flight heritage. And as well as look at a new additive manufacturing, and we picked um, serial lithography, which provides higher quality parts with more uniform properties. Uh, and they're more accurate with fewer defects. And we finally ended up going with Bluestone because um, it, it had a high moisture resistance that we wanted to avoid this time. It had high thermal resistance, it had an increased stiffness, and it was a very smooth surface finish, and it was non-porous. Um, 
now we reached a new problem after deciding on that because unlike uh, Ultima 85 that's a thermoplastic, bluestone is a thermoset polymer, which is a material that strengthens when it's heated. So then once it's finalized, it cannot be remodeled or heated after initially forming. So therefore you can use the heat inserts. So then we looked at um, different types of inserts that we could and we found pressing filters as well as self-tapping threaded inserts that have been used for uh, thermosets before. However, uh, we were trying to sort of do evaluation between these two to see what the benefits and the risk of each of them on terms of how strong the final interface would be, um, how well the insert is likely to be aligned, and the risk of damaging the part during installation. And we did a different sort of um, trial and runs and trying to see how we could insert them. And we've, what we found out is that the bluestone part is actually um, more, far more brittle than we expect it to be. And it sort of feels more of a ceramic material than it is a plastic. And therefore, we had a concern that the material would not deform very much, uh, making it more difficult to install the inserts and possibly introducing st stress concentrations um, to the parts. So after doing, you know, using sort of different pressing methods to push them or um, the tapping method using a mill, we found out that this is very risky and there were certain fractures that were caused. Um, but we still had another flight hair, uh, flight version of it left, so we had two different, um, two of each of the components. So once we tested everything on the first one, we realized that we can't really do either the press or the mill situation to tap them in. Um, and what we decided to go with was we would widen the holes a little bit to, um, to create a semi-snug or even a loose fit, and then sort of put the press in, fill, uh, inserts in there and epoxy on that gap and let that cure uh, for a while and then make sure that um, after that we checked, we checked that when we torqued the bolts and everything that it didn't, the insert didn't really rotate uh, inside that sort of loose hole. So that's showing that the epoxy worked perfectly as well as we made sure that we're using the right uh, epoxy uh, that doesn't, uh, has the correct outgassing properties and is uh, space safe. And this is the sort of the final, um, part as you can see it's a blue stone it looks more um, smooth um, and everything else looks pretty much similar to the one before so finally i want to conclude this um, presentation by saying that we you know uh, throughout this presentation we introduced a uhf antenna deployment mechanism technique used on the gt1 mission uh, talked about the design aspects manufacturing and testing methods as, as well as problems encountered and the solutions that were uh, finalized so that we could um, make sure that we can actually attach it to the spacecraft. And then finally, I wanted to present uh, or suggest at least a few uh, design considerations for you know GT2, GT3, GT4, or other spacecrafts that are uh, trying to design um, antenna deployment mechanisms. So I think there should there are a lot of plastics that are space safe that um, you should just do more trade study of the materials to use, as well as you know understand what types of inserts would work. Um, and make sure that everything for that is finalized so that you don't run into problems. Um, you can also look into other manufacturing methods. I think additive manufacturing is very good because it's very uh, fast and it reduces cost. But if your design is really detailed and whatnot, or not as detailed, uh, sorry, and um, you have the cost and you think your part is fully detailed uh, or finalized, then you could maybe consider CNC machining. Um, and then um, also this part could have been more mass efficient. You could, uh, there are different design techniques that could allow you to take part mass out of certain spots um, that wouldn't really make it not structurally sound, but it would actually reduce the mass of it. And then other things that you could think about are mechanical actuation. So instead of using the burn wire that has a kind of sort of a tedious and sort of hard resetting method, you can now use a mechanical actuation. So such as like a door just opening, um, and then you could just, close that door again, as simple as that, and reset the mechanism. And then other things that are really not um, related to the mechanism or the mechanical part of it, but maybe considering using two antennas that are orthogonal to each other uh, for more coverage. Finally, I just want to thank Dr. Lightsey for allowing me to work on this project in SSDL under him. I've learned an incredible amount within the past year about space system design, um, and it was a great uh, opportunity for me. I also want to uh, thank the GT1 team for all their hard work and all the times that we've had. Uh, we've gone through a lot of problems and figuring out a lot of solutions. And right now we're in the home stretch. We're going through our environmental testing.
and hopefully everything goes well from here and we can deliver the spacecraft. And thank you for everybody for listening. And if you have any questions, uh, I can answer them. Is there any question to Colin? Uh, okay, I didn't hear any. Uh, I have a quick question. So, do you need to worry about yeah. the vibration? Or do you need to do any vibration test before uh, you finish the CubeSat? Yes, you do. Um, we actually are going through our environmental testing right now. And uh, coincidentally, today is our vibe test. So based off the vibrations that are caused by the launch vehicle, um, you have certain values. And then you sort of put it on a plate that sort of imitates the vibrations that you are um, will experience once during the launch vehicle. And so the whole spacecraft is integrated right now, and we're going to do that vibe test to make sure, you know, none of the bolts get unscrewed or none of the deployment mechanism accidentally deploy when they shouldn't be. Um, so hopefully after today, we'll know if that's the case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions now? Uh, okay, if there are no questions, so let's sign client one more time. And uh, let's move to the second talk today, okay? Thank you. Shravan, can you start to share your screen? Yes, certainly. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Let me know when you can see it. Uh-huh. Uh, one sec. And... Yeah, I can see that. Okay, perfect. And can you see and hear me okay as well? Yes, no problem. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, Hello, everybody. So now's our second presentation from Shavan Hariharan. Uh, he is a fifth year undergraduate student graduating at the end of this semester. He has conducted five semesters of undergraduate research, including three semesters of research with, doc, uh, with Professor John Deck on entry descent and the landing modeling for Mars applications. Um, he had previously conducted research with the Experimental Aerodynamics Concept Group and the Aerospace Systems Design Lab. Outside of his academic pursuits, uh, Shavan has completed five internships at companies such as NASA Langley Research Center, Northrop Grumman, Spin Launch, and Blue Origin. After his graduation this semester, he will be interning with, uh, uh, interning with uh, the Entry Descent and the Landing Group at NASA JPL before beginning graduate school next August. So today he will talk about a flexible thermal protection system designed for Mars entry application. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, my name is Shravan Hariharan, and like Dr. Sun mentioned, I've been researching with Professor John Deck for the last three semesters, and today I'll be sharing a little bit of the progress I've made on the uh, flexible thermal protection system designed for Mars entry applications. So, to uh, give you a little bit of an overview of what I'll be talking about today, I'll begin with a background and introduction into flexible thermal protection systems, what they are, why they're important, and why it's necessary to model them at a higher fidelity. I'll then move into the process, uh, including my past steps, my current work, and then the next steps in my uh, research project, followed by the steps themselves, which are the modeling of different entry trajectories from Mars, the calculation of stagnation point uh, heat fluxes for each of these entry trajectories, and then the thermal response modeling for flexible thermal protection system designs for a trajectory. Um, and like all research projects, this is an ongoing project that doesn't really have a defined finish point as of now. So it's something that I do plan on continuing in my graduate school education. Uh, so I'll touch on the next steps moving forward. So a little bit of background, Heritage Mars entry systems to date have all used rigid thermal protection systems. Upon atmospheric entry, the temperatures reach a very high value and it's necessary to protect the payload from these temperatures as well as the hot, air, the hot gases uh, from the flow. So uh, the most recent system is called PICA. It's phenolic impregnated carbon ablator. And you can see that there on the image on the left. Now, PICA is a rigid heat shield. It's lightweight and it's great in terms of thermal protection, but it is limited by the launch vehicle payload fairing diameter. So to date right now, the largest operational payload fairing is 5.4 meters in diameter. 
And there are rockets that still haven't been constructed that are designed to have seven or nine meter fairings. But even then, that's less than twice the size of the current uh, allowable maximum. And the heat shield you see there is four and a half meters. So we're basically, we've reached the limit in terms of the size of our rigid thermal protection systems. However, future human missions are estimated to have 20 to 80 times the payload mass of the small robotic missions that have landed on Mars to date. Because of this larger mass, a larger drag device and decelerator area is needed to slow these, uh, the payloads down to their necessary velocities before secondary uh, deceleration devices can be deployed, like parachutes or the sky crane that the Mars Science Laboratory used. So that is why NASA has conducted studies into something called a HIAD. Now, a HIAD stands for a Hypersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Decelerator. As the name suggests, it's packaged in a small volume uh, in the launch vehicle itself, and then upon, upon deployment, it's inflated to its larger size. This means that you can have a small, uh, you can have a very large decelerator packaged into a small volume, so you're no longer constrained by your launch uh, vehicle payload bearing. Now, as you can see in the image uh, in the bottom right, the structure of the Hyatt is composed of concentric tori, and they're pressurized and inflated upon deployment. This retains the aeroshell structure throughout entry, um, and that's really important because we don't want the heat shield to fall apart during entry. However, as this is an inflatable system, the thermal protection system that goes on the top of it has to be inflatable, or has to be packaged as well, and a rigid system wouldn't work for that. Therefore, NASA has conducted several studies over the last few years into flexible thermal protection systems, and that's what I've been working on. So, um, the FTPS, as they call it, is composed of three main layers per the current design. So on the outside, there's an exterior ceramic cloth, which protects the payload from, uh, and the underlying layers from aerodynamic shear forces. So there in the bottom right, you can see a traditional HIAD layup, and that is what the SICK SIC fiber is. Next, you have high temperature insulators, multiple of these, and this is where most of the thermal protection comes from. So Sivertherm KFA5 is the primary insulator, followed by Pyrogel 2250 or 3350. This is still a work in progress, so the materials haven't been finalized yet, which is part of what I'm trying to do. And then finally, there's an imper impermeable gas barrier, which is the KZL, uh, the Captain's Island laminate that you see in the bottom there, to protect the tori, the structure, from any hot gases reaching it. Now, the biggest requirement here is that the bottom of this entire layup cannot exceed the maximum allowable bond line temperature, which is 400 degrees Celsius. However, the FTPS layup design is of a very low TRL. There's significant uncertainty in the material selection, as well as the required layer thickness. Um, so I'm going to get into that now. So Hyatt layups have traditionally been tested largely through ArcJet testing. Now ArcJet testing is very expensive. You configure your chamber for specified heat flux and specified atmosphere conditions. You put a small sample of your thermal protection system in the chamber, and then you put several thermal couples throughout and you measure the thermal response. This means that each ArcJet test is for one Hyatt layup at one atmosphere condition. If you're doing this to determine if your layup meets the requirements for a set of entry trajectories, that means that it gets very expensive and it gets very time intensive. So my project was designed to develop a series of coupled computational models to determine the necessary FTPS material thicknesses and therefore the resulting mass for a given entry trajectory. So if you, have, if you know how you're entering Mars, it would calculate through a series of coupled programs what your trajectory looks like what your maximum heat flux is, and then we'd be able to model the necessary the minimum thickness to meet your temperature requirements. A follow-up goal to that is then to compare the mass of a Hyatt FTPS to the traditional rigid PICA heat shield. As I'd mentioned earlier, the reason Hyatts are necessary is because of the larger payload mass that's required for future human missions. However, uh, one of the secondary goals of this study was to determine if even for a small robotic mission, if the HIAD is uh, more efficient than a PICA heat shield in terms of thermal protection. Because it is already more efficient in terms of packaging volume, if it has a lower mass than a PICA heat shield as well, this means it's desirable for uh, small robotic missions because you can get more payload to the surface. And then a stretch goal, which I have not gotten into yet, uh, but as I said, this is an ongoing project, is to determine thickness margins to get a range of thicknesses for a dispersed set of entry trajectories through a Monte Carlo uncertainty analysis. So 
uh, like I mentioned earlier, there's several steps uh, to go through this, and I'll be going through each of these in order, beginning with uh, trajectory calculation. So I looked at two different kinds of entry trajectories, which have been the two trajectories used for most Mars missions to date. So all of the trajectories besides the Viking landers used a direct hyperbolic entry. So through this, this is similar to what uh, I'm sure many of you have studied in your spacecraft uh, flight dynamics courses. It's uh, a near home and transfer that has a departure hyperbola from Earth and then a transfer ellipse around the sun and then an arrival hyperbola upon Mars. Now this results in higher entry velocity, which is not desirable for thermal protection. And there's less flexibility with changes in mission design. However, there's a smaller cumulative delta V, which is desirable for a propellant standpoint. So if you already are certain about your landing site and about the other, other aspects of your mission profile, this is typically how they're designed. The uh, system that I wanted to look at more was entry from parking orbits. So this is what the Viking landers did. Uh, so you arrive at Mars and then you get placed into an elliptical parking orbit around Mars. From there, you're able to take images of landing sites you're able to select landing sites and you can delay landing if necessary to make sure you can check out all of your systems and account for any surface conditions um, that may be changing. Now this also results in a lower entry velocity, which is desirable for thermal protection systems. And like I mentioned, you get flexibility with landing site and time. However, there is a larger cumulative Delta V, so it's not desirable from a propellant standpoint, uh, but I wanted to look at both conditions because what in the design of future Mars missions, both trajectories are going to be examined. So in order to do this, I selected a total of nine trajectories for this initial effort. So eight entry trajectories from a parking orbit and one from a direct entry. To select these, I looked at a study conducted by Professor Bobby Braun, who uh, used to teach at Georgia Tech, as well as my own uh, efforts on likely Mars sites, as well as efficient parking orbits that allow accessibility to several of these sites um, and are efficient in terms of Delta V to enter these parking orbits. And then for a direct entry, I used the Mars Science Laboratory mission as a baseline, uh, using the ephemeris to calculate the uh, delta V and then the entry velocity. For each of these trajectories, I looked at the entry velocity and the flight path angle at the Mars atmospheric interface, which is 125 kilometers above the surface. Um, so the Mars uh, entry corridor, the flight path angle, is dependent on variables such as the lift to drag ratio, the ballistic coefficient, and the bank angle. So I used uh, prior HIAD modeling efforts as well as previous studies or, and reports published for successful Mars missions to determine these values. From there, we numerically integrated uh, the flight vehicle equations of motion. What this did is it took all of the inputs of the vehicle uh, geometry and trajectory at the entry interface altitude. And then as it was descending through Mars surface, it output the altitude, velocity, and ambient atmosphere conditions at each second. Now this is the first step, traje trajectory modeling. I then took these models and used them to calculate the stagnation point heat fluxes um, for each trajectory. So I used the Fay Riddell method, uh, which is a higher fidelity but more complicated method than the more commonly used Sutton Graves method for preliminary studies. And this was used to determine the stagnation point heat flux and total heat load uh, throughout the entire flight. Now, the maximum vehicle heat flux is likely at the stagnation point, so it is the point of interest. It's your design to baseline because that's where you have the most heat going into your system. And I wanted to make these programs as coupled as possible while still utilizing uh, heritage programs that Professor Deck and others had developed. So what I did is I formatted the output from the trajectory uh, modeling program so that I could directly input it into a hypersonic equilibrium flow heating program. So there's no in-between, you take the output, you feed it into the next program, and then it uses the Fay Riddell method shown below to determine the stagnation point heat flux uh, for each second of the trajectory. So then this is the first two steps uh, completed, trajectory modeling and then stagnation point heating. And like I said earlier, this is all for a preliminary study. Um, my goal was to make sure that this process is as, as efficient as possible so that for any given Mars mission, you can then calculate all of these steps in a row. Next, I moved into the thermal response modeling. And for this, I used a program called FEAR developed by Professor Dick. It stands for Finite Element Ablation and Thermal Response. Now, traditional 1D heat transfer programs that NASA uses, such as FIAT, are limited in areas of high curvature, uh, which the stagnation point region of the FTPS is. Uh, 
Now, FEAR computes both the in-plane as well as through thickness thermal effects for high curvature geometries, which gives you higher fidelity results. Um, so there was, uh, I just had to use the, the user's manual and tinker a lot, around with this a lot to understand how I could utilize this program for my specific project case. And the inputs to this file are listed below. So first I had to generate a mesh file for a uh, Hyad layout, which I'll be moving into momentarily with all of the assigned materials and boundary conditions. I next had to outline all the boundary conditions, which included things like the heat flux as well as radiation. And then I would have to build material property files for each material in the FTPS, as well as surface chemistry files for the ablators. So uh, for this, I used a software called GMesh to generate the mesh here. So you can see here in the bottom, it's a 2D mesh with the full through thickness dimension of the Hyatt FTPS. So you can see at the top there, there is the SICK fiber, which is the exterior ceramic cloth. Then the primary insulator, KFA5, followed by Pyrogel 3350, the secondary insulator. Uh, so a few things to note here. KFA5 is the material where I'll be primarily iterating through thicknesses in order to determine what thickness is required to meet the bond line temperature requirement. Uh, I also neglected the gas barrier here because it is very small and it doesn't provide a significant amount of thermal protection. That makes this a conservative study uh, because it still will provide some kind of thermal protection. But if we're sizing to this conservative study, we can ensure that the thicknesses we compute will be successful in terms of protecting the underlying structure. Now I used GMesh because it's an open source and well-documented software. So as we all know, that makes it a lot easier to learn uh, if you can just read up on the documentation and play around with it yourself. More importantly, it is script driven which means it allows me to parametrize the mesh generation for any given layup. I can put the number of plies of the KFA fiber as a variable, and then when generating a new mesh file as I'm iterating through the different thicknesses as I mentioned, I can just change that variable and generate a file with the same properties just with the thickness changed, uh, which saves a lot of time when I'm iterating through several uh, layups for several different trajectories. Uh, and like I mentioned, I had to include all the materials and boundary conditions in the mesh definition script which uh, the boundary conditions are shown here. So at the leading edge, uh, I had to include the heat flux, which I had previously calculated uh, at the stagnation point, as well as surface radiation through the boundary layer to the Martian surface. Uh, next, I had to account, I put zero flow boundary conditions at the sides of the test section. Now we're assuming that the uh, in-plane in dimension is much larger than the through thickness dimension. Uh, so the biggest focus here was to calculate the through thickness dimension while still accounting for the in-plane effects, which can then be uh, applied to the full geometry. And then at the back wall, I had to put a zero recession boundary because that's where the um, that's where the Hyad Tori is. That's the end of the FTPS, and it's at that back wall where we need to meet the temperature requirement of 400 degrees Celsius. So that's what I've been doing to date. Um, it's a pretty intensive project that required a lot of preliminary steps to get into the thermal modeling. And right now I'm currently in the process of manually creating the KFA5 and the Pyrogel 3350 material property files to meet the uh, FEAR input requirements. Now this uh, necessitates accounting for changes in the thermal properties at different temperatures and pressures. So I'm doing that right now and I'm hoping to get that finished up in the next few weeks so that I can move into the next immediate step which is to run a mesh sensitivity study for just one trajectory input to determine the coarsest mesh that will give me high fidelity results. So by making the mesh finer and coarser, I'll be able to see how this changes the measured temperature. And then from there, I need to pick the coarsest mesh that still gives me um, a good temperature. And this will reduce computational time moving forward as this is in serial computing right now. And then the step following that is to use this optimized mesh to run FEAR for all the trajectory cases, the nine that I mentioned previously, to determine the minimum material layer thicknesses to meet the 400 degrees Celsius bond line temperature requirement. Now, these are just the immediate next steps. This, there's still a lot of work to be done just because the goal is to get a high fidelity model that even accounts for uncertainties in our uh, entry trajectory, as well as non, things like non-equilibrium flow. So like I mentioned earlier, this is something that I would certainly continue uh, into my graduate studies um, and hopefully better inform the design of HIAD flexible thermal protection systems for Mars entry applications. So I would like to first thank Professor John Deck for the opportunity to research with him.
Uh, I'm really excited to bring my EDL experience to JPL, uh, where I'll be interning in the spring, and I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, um, I have a question here. Uh, how do you handle the uh, chemical parts when you do the simulation? Like uh, any reactions? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Uh, did you consider any chemical reactions? Like, uh, for example, uh, uh, during the reentry process, uh, process, the temperature is so high and there's going to be lots of uh, chemical reactions, mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. on the surface yeah. and also in ambient air. Certainly. Um, so when ca calculating the heating here, uh, we I used as a baseline an equilibrium flow program created by Professor Deck, and then I modified it to account for my application, where it uses the temperature as well as the ambient conditions and the material properties to determine the equilibrium um, flow temperature, like heat fluxes, which accounts for decomposition of gases and high temperature effects. So it wasn't treated as a perfect gas and it did account for these equilibrium effects. However, like I, um, the non-equilibrium thermal effects or chemical effects are something that I would account for in the Monte Carlo simulation moving forward as they are an uncertainty in the simulation. And the Feyerdel method is still a it's it is still an approximation. ArcJet testing is the highest level of validation. It assumes a spherical nose, and that it's derived from there. Um, so this is higher fidelity than a preliminary study, but there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that the conditions I'm accounting for account for uh, connections on the surface as well as non-equilibrium chemical reactions in the air itself. Okay, thank you very much. So this is definitely a very complicated problem. Um, Certainly. Other questions? Okay, so if there are no uh, other questions, so let's thank Shervan one more time. And uh, then we are concluding uh, this week's uh, Brownback Launch Seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.